An attempt to obtain elements heavier than uranium, the last heavy elements on Earth, was undertaken by Enrico Fermi in 1934. He observed unusual beta activity, and his first assumption was that this is probably an element heavier than uranium, which is formed in a nuclear reaction. However, it turned out that this had nothing to do with an element heavier than uranium, but rather that Enrico was on the path to determining the birth of a new element through induced radioactivity. Neptunium, element 93, with an atomic mass of 237, was synthesized by Macmillan and Abelson in 1940, and in the same year, uranium-38 was irradiated with deuterons, and in the reaction with the emission of two neutrons, neptunium formed N, which, as a result of beta decay, passed into plutonium-238. Plutonium was born in 1940, before the war. I would like to point out to you that between 1940 and 2003, 1.3 tons of plutonium was produced, and it increased to 2,000 tons by 2010. There is plutonium, plutonium production, plutonium technologies, plutonium chemistry, and so forth. This man-made metal has become an ordinary metal for the needs of human society. But plutonium will not be the only one. Having created a powerful reactor, we will talk more about this a little later, where we have large fluxes of neutrons of different energies ranging from thermal and ending with fast neutrons. By placing plutonium-39 in the reactor, we can go even further. In plutonium-40, neutron capture takes place as in plutonium-41, plutonium-42 and plutonium-43. And along the way, these new formations will undergo beta decay. A neutron will pass into a proton and it will pass into americium, the next element number 95. The same effect will be observed with americium. Along the way, these isotopes will pass into curium. This will also be observed with curium and again with elements 97 berkelium, 98 californium, 99 einsteinium and 100 fermium. In principle, it is possible to obtain transuranium isotope 257 if you put the initial plutonium material in a reactor that is irradiated in this powerful reactor for one year. After one year, you can reach fermium. Of course, in this case, there will be large losses because each capture of a neutron leads to fission, and already at the first stage, 64% of plutonium will be divided into fission products. At the second stage, the remaining 36% divides into 26% fission product. At the third stage, 10% will be divided, and so on and so forth. Therefore, a very small amount of substance will reach the end, which will already be only tenths or hundredths of a percent. This is how transuranium elements accumulate in the reactor. Here, they are shown. Here, horizontally, neutron capture, and this is beta decay. Neutron capture, beta decay, neutron capture, beta decay. And here is fermium-257. After another capture, it will become fermium-258. And then a catastrophe happens. Fermium-257 lives for one year. It can be irradiated in a reactor for a full year. Fermium-258 lives for only 0.3 milliseconds before dividing. The end result of this chain consisting of sequential neutron captures and the transitioning into beta decays is that it disappears. There is no further development. The very last element will be fermium-257 due to the fact that the next isotope lives for such a short period of time. This means that in this case it is quite clear that a stationary neutron flux is not possible. You need to somehow negate those 0.3 milliseconds. 
we need a pulsed high-power flow, and this pulsed high-power flow can be obtained in a nuclear explosion, if we start again from plutonium-239. I would like to note that the nuclear explosion, which we will elaborate on at a later stage, requires 10 kilograms of plutonium, which is here. Having obtained a critical mass, emits as many neutrons as the most powerful reactor emits over a period of 25 years. This is achieved in 300 nanoseconds. In 300 nanoseconds, plutonium captures successive neutrons. Sometimes the nucleus does not have time to discharge in the gamma quanta, and the second neutron, even the third neutron, are captured. This is how 18, probably 20 neutrons can be captured. All this will take about 0.5 microseconds, and you can reach very heavy plutonium-257. Then, when everything calms down, beta decays will take place, longer nuclear transformations, and plutonium-257 will turn back into fermium-257. If the transformation took place, then it would turn into fermium-258, which lives for 0.3 milliseconds. If there were further developments, then it would turn into fermium-259. But there is also very little time at this stage of the process, only one and a half seconds. Generally speaking, an underground explosion is not suitable for transformations. To arrive at a super-heavy element in this way, it was necessary to go in such a way as to capture not 18 to 20, but 60 to 70 neutrons. But this power is not in the explosion, so this method does not work. I want to show you five underground nuclear explosions that took place in the United States. Three of them are shown here. PAR, also known as Operation Plowshare, Barbell, referred to as Operation Whetstone, and Mike, also known as Operation Ivy, which have 7 times 10 to the power of 24 neutrons per square centimeter. It's like the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And this is how the mass yield decreases, which then potentially becomes heavier elements through beta decays. From 244 up to 257, we see a drop of nine orders of magnitude. This means that the points indicate an experiment, but the lines that simply connect the points indicate a calculation. I must say that the calculation realistically reproduces all the manipulations involved in an underground explosion. In total, only five explosions out of 550 explosions were conducted for scientific purposes, the rest of which were, of course, done for military purposes. But we are interested only in those conducted for scientific purposes. So, let's take the most powerful cyclamen, also known as Operation Flintlock, which was made in Los Alamos on May 5, 1966, where the fluence was 1.2 times 10 to the power of 25 neutrons per centimeter squared. If you divide this by 0.5 microsecond, you will better understand the pulse power. And here are the outputs of the nuclei, and this is fermium. It is possible that maybe the following short-lived fermium isotopes were obtained, but that it was difficult to reach them. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we want to get this nucleus and these explosions to end much faster. Therefore, when utilizing the neutron method, even an underground nuclear explosion is not suitable for synthesizing super-heavy elements. The neutron method is not used, although, as we will see later, many transuranic elements were obtained by capturing neutrons in powerful reactors and in nuclear explosions. In order to synthesize neptunium, uranium was irradiated with neutrons. In order to synthesize plutonium, Uranium was irradiated with deuterons. And then, to obtain americium, plutonium was irradiated with neutrons. In order to obtain curium, plutonium was bombarded with alpha particles. And when it came to einsteinium and fermium, for which nuclear explosions were required, the nuclear explosions were not underground, but rather airborne. That is, a device exploded at a high altitude, and an unmanned aircraft went to the explosion site, took air samples from the area where the explosion took place, and elements Einsteinium-99 and Fermium-100 were isolated from these samples. I would like to summarize by saying that neither a powerful stationary reactor, nor a nuclear explosion, even of high power, can lead us to obtain super-heavy elements 
because of the sharp drop in fission products during neutron capture. All subsequent experiments have been conducted with ions. This Einsteinium was irradiated with alpha particles. Mendelevium was obtained in the States. Nobelium was obtained by irradiating americium with nitrogen. Lawrencium was obtained by irradiating californium with boron-11. Here are the pioneers of these experiments. The famous radiochemist of the United States and Nobel laureate Glenn Seaborg and his closest colleague and assistant Albert Giosho. We started from here and we see this theoretical sun. But we are striving to reach this point here. And so, the neutron method has led us to this part. Due to the fact that fermium-258 turned out to be very short-lived, we could not advance further than fermium-257, either in a stationary reactor or in capturing neutrons during a nuclear explosion.